for the month of September and then returns on a once a month basis afterwards in the evening. Uh, so be sure to check our calendar and sign up for any of these future programs. Um, Ashley will continue to bring us fantastic speakers on a variety of gardening topics. So now please welcome Ashley Rooney. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everybody. And I have another fantastic speaker today. <laughs> I met Holly when she jumped up during a garden club presentation and spoke about some conservation work she'd been doing. I then asked her to help me in cleaning up the Monroe Tavern lawns, which had many pit holes and we needed to do something about them so nobody tripped. And she was wonderful to work with. Subsequently, we've gone on to do other things. But one of her interests was pollinator was meadow gardening. And I thought this would be something that would be fascinating for this audience. It's those meadows or wildflower meadows are a relatively new concept. You certainly our parents didn't know about them, except if they were natural. And Holly's going to tell us how to do one today. Great if you don't want to mow your lawn anymore. So Holly, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. So uh Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here with you. I want to share a project that uh, I find uh, extremely exciting. Um, it's a little bit experimental, but uh, why not? Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, in 2014, I retired from 30 years in uh, public school library work uh, in Boston and Cambridge. And before I retired, I thought, what am I going to do for the rest of my life that's really going to be fun and interesting and hopefully outdoors? And I love gardening and I love design. So I started taking courses at something called the Landscape Institute, which was part of the Radcliffe Seminars for many years, and then moved to Boston Architectural College where I started taking classes. So I started this certificate program in about uh, 2011 uh, and was lucky to be one of the last people to graduate from it before it folded in 2017, unfortunately. Um, so I learned a lot, I loved it, and I started working and I started doing a lot of professional development after my certification. And um, I'm gonna share with you a project that is kind of the result of uh, my environmental interests, my design interests, my gardening interests. And um, without further ado, I'm gonna take it away. So I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully everything works right here. And we can take away the bar. There we go. So I'm calling this uh, stylized meadows for the suburban landscape. And um, I've had a number of influences on this. And I'm going to share those too. Let's see if I can make work this with my, uh, I guess I have to use my mouse. Uh, a number of books and people have influenced me. The first was uh, Doug Tallamy. Uh, reading Doug Tallamy's book about uh, the importance of insects in the ecosystem was really very important. And it's influenced, I know, a lot of gardeners uh, around. Um, and how we can use native plants to, to give food sources for these insects that really can't survive on non-native plants, um, which are a lot of our garden plants, unfortunately. I was also, uh, I also read uh, another book by him, which is a little bit more about design uh, with Rick Dark, uh, using these native plants for design. And by uh, Thomas Rainier and Claudia West, I saw Claudia West speak a few times, uh, designing plants that can really, plant communities that are very resilient uh, in the face of climate change and, and uh, maybe some arid conditions. And Larry Weiner, uh, who wrote a book called Garden Revolution, he's a landscape designer out of uh, Pennsylvania, and I've worked with him a few times. Um, so even just in garden design, we can have an influence in environmental change. And so this is very exciting to me. Uh, and I'm going to give you three slides, three only, of uh, the importance of uh, starting to eliminate some of the non-native landscape in our yards one of which is lawn. Uh, I'll read this aloud. We dump roughly 10 times more fertilizer on our lawns than on crops. Those fertilizers and the 67 million pounds of pesticides with which we drench our lawns every year degrade, releasing compounds like nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas, 298 times more potent than CO2. 
And for mowing those lawns, according to the EPA, we use 580 million gallons of gas each year in lawnmowers that emit, emit as much pollution in one hour as 40 automobiles driving, accounting for roughly 10 to 18 percent of non-road gasoline emissions. And if you're not convinced, after those two, according to University of Florida Ecology and Conservation Professor Mark Hostetler, producing no seeds, nectar, or fruit, few creatures can use lawns as habitat. Biodiversity-wise, it's almost like concrete. So your lawn is supporting as much life as the sidewalk. Years ago, we used to have, a clover was acceptable in lawns some years ago, uh, but now we can't have anything but just just grass, just turf grass, which is a non-native, and it spreads and creates a, an impenetrable carpet. And with all the chemicals we put on it, particularly, nothing can live there. So I thought, what are what are some alternatives here? Some lawn is is useful if it's maintained uh, organically. It's nice uh, if it's mowed with a, a electric mower or hand power uh, non-power mower. It's even better. Uh, but some lawn is nice to work out to work to walk on, and it's also nice to. Uh, to sort of offset beautiful flower beds. Um, so I thought, is there another eco-friendly option to replace at least some of our high maintenance lawn? Now, this is beautiful. And I love gardens like this. They're just gorgeous to look at. Um, but think what happens when those lilies, those beautiful Casablanca lilies in the middle, when they die, there's nothing there but stalks, excuse me. And when the, when the other flowers are gone, uh, it's not as beautiful. So this kind of garden, you may be able to have some succession of bloom, but it requires a lot of maintenance. Um, same thing with this. What, what's not to love about this, how gorgeous it is. It has beautiful, design-wise, has beautiful rhythm, repeated colors and forms, um, but also that beautiful purple salvia. Uh, when that goes, you have to cut it all back, maybe get another rebloom. So there's a lot of maintenance required here. So I thought, what about a meadow? Now, this is uh, our Idlewild Community Garden, the Idlewild Conservation Area. The community gardens, you can see them uh, in the back here. In um, Lexington. In Lexington, yeah, I have a, I have a garden plot here. Um, and this is, the, this is the Idlewild Meadow, uh, just a little after peak bloom. So you see a little bit of goldenrod in here. You see in the back, the Joe Pye weed, the pink Joe Pye weed is now turning brown. But meadows are just uh, a fantastic um, uh, source uh, for wildlife. I can go to the next one here. Beautiful wildflowers at certain times of year. Um, they're just iconic and beautiful. They give the eye a way to look across the landscape because you know we're, we live in a, a naturally forested area. If we didn't mow, you know, a meadow has to be mowed uh, once a year, at least once a year, or it will revert back to a forest. Um, but these qualities of meadow, I thought it really were interesting. Uh, and uh, let's go over them. So they have, uh, meadow is really a plant community with different plants occupying different strata. So there, there are some plants that stay at low ground level, some that are taller, 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 et cetera. And the ones that can shoot up and, and receive the sunlight um, can tolerate more sun. And there's also a strata below ground. So some of the plants only take uh, shallow, are only shallow rooted and others are deeper and deeper. Some of the taller grasses are very deep rooted. Um, so, but they work together this way. They, uh, they form a community that's, that supports each other and they live together nicely. They're rich with wildlife. And when who's ever stood near a meadow, hears the bees buzzing and sees the butterflies. Um, and they change with the seasons and also with the years, they evolve. So there's, uh, there's something organic and, and interesting to watch about them. And once they're established, besides an annual mowing, uh, if you want to do that, uh, there's not really a lot of maintenance. There's a little bit of weeding on the establishment phase. Um, but uh, but once they're, they're done with that, they're pretty much self-supporting. But to create a meadow, and it, these large meadows are usually created from seed, so you need a fairly large amount of space. Uh, you need extensive ground preparation because if you've got a lot of seed in there already, you're going to get coming up what, what's already there. 
Um, you need careful plant selection, which is true in any garden, but you have to look at all these factors, soil type, sun exposure, the water, the plant compatibility, and that weed maintenance that I was talking about. <clears throat> I want to keep moving this around because I don't know if it's blocking my screen. Let's see. Okay. Um, plants in a typical meadow in this area, and they can get pretty large and sometimes kind of aggressive. This New York ironweed can get about six and a half, seven feet tall. Look at the Joe Pie. Uh, there, are, there are lower cultivars of this Joe Pie, uh, but if they were allowed to go to seed, I have a feeling they might revert back to the type, which is this tall, up to eight feet they can be. Indian grass can get even taller than this. And the Canada goldenrod that we typically see around here can be very aggressive and can sort of take over a meadow if there's not a lot of good competition. So, um, let's see. So I wonder if there's a way to adapt uh, this kind of planting to a typical suburban third or half acre plot and still have some positive environmental impact and make it manageable. So what special considerations might you need? So the first list I made here was that it should look fairly presentable, not too wild, not too tall, not too looming, um, be bordered by something. So it doesn't look out of control or get out of control and look intentional. Uh, it should have flowers, at least during some parts of the growing season, so it can be pretty to look at. And um, some visual interest during winter, if you don't mow it down, uh, some of these plants can stay up. They can be visually interesting, but also they can provide seed for, for wildlife in the winter. Um, provide food for wildlife. And some other considerations for small meadow design, uh, which would be true for any garden design. You have to look at the kind of soil you have, the kind of light you have, the kind of water you have, the kind of wildlife conditions that you have. And in our area, this is the particular predator for plants um, that is driving a lot of us gardeners really crazy, these rabbits. So, uh, in fact, this is a southern variety of rabbit that's come up into this area and, uh, and is just multiplying like, like crazy, like rabbits. So we have to really think about these rabbits. So in thinking about making them, a small meadow like this, my plant selection criteria were, um, what's the bloom time and color? Uh, what's the height, very important. Uh, I want plants that have some kind of pollinator interest, or not only for, for nectar, but also for uh, laying eggs, just as with monarch butterflies, uh, they'll lay their eggs on the milkweeds and then the larva can eat the milkweed leaves. So are there plants that will allow for that kind of nourishment for the young in insects? Because then the birds come and they love to eat those larvae and then you have a wonderful ecosystem. Uh, some foliage variation so that uh, it's also more visually interesting and plant companionability, just uh, as I was talking about the meadow, that there are different strata above ground and below ground um, that you want the plants to be able to find so they can live together and yeah. just tastefulness to rabbits, if we could do that. So um, an opportunity came along. So I had a neighbor, I have a neighbor who lives uh, quite around the corner from me. And um, he lives in a 1980s ranch. And uh, so the, which seems to have the original foundation plantings, um, all of which are non-native plants. So you, we have the Missouri holly, uh, rhododendrons, uh, various kinds of azaleas, um, a big uh, yew on one side, a left side there, a, a, a tree in the front that is, is always driving him crazy because it gets too big. And he's got to, to try to keep these foundation plants from swallowing his house. He had some large uh, pine trees where you see the this rough area here that he, that he removed and I said to him David you need a plan <laughs> so I convinced him that he could that he needed a landscape design plan and I gave him a few different plans uh, some which were rather traditional and um, I have my notes here. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. And um, 
with curving beds and some small trees and so forth. But I gave him one plan uh, that was um, very different, very simple. So this is what the plan looked like. Uh, the residence is here in his driveway very simple plant groupings and that made them cultivars of native shrubs uh, as foundation plantings, a new path and, and something simple along the path, a nice lawn and a meadow along the sidewalk. And he liked this idea. He is an architect, he likes uh, clean lines and he wanted to try it. So I had an opportunity uh, that tell you this is 10 feet by 100 feet. So this is a thousand square feet uh, area. Um, so I poured over uh, garden books and uh, plant vendor websites and read all about everything I could about meadow plants and native plants and um, you know knew some of these plants, some of them I had heard of and just seen uh, pictures of, uh, many of them I hadn't seen in real life. Um, but I made a list and this, is, this list will be available to people that are watching uh, through the library so you can get a hold of this so don't have to worry about writing anything down. And don't be afraid of this because the, I'm going to talk later about the size plants I used. So they were very small plants and so we, we use large quantities. Uh, but you can see here the botanical name, the common name, whether it's a native or not. Uh, in some cases native is a little bit of a stretch. Maybe they're a, a prairie native or a, a little bit south of here native, but, but many people are using these in native plantings uh, in this area. So they're, and they survive quite well. Um, then I saw the height. I'm telling you the height and how many plants. You see, I use four different ground cover plants with part of my goal being to cover that ground so that uh, we don't need to do mulching and give insects some cover for the winter and, um, and to keep the invasive plant seed uh, that is inevitably gonna fall in there uh, from germinating if possible. Um, and maybe keep the plants, the plant seed of the plants we want from going crazy in there. So there's a ground cover layer, a mid height layer, which is about one to two feet tall. And then a tall layer, which uh, tops out with only a few plants that are maybe five feet. Um, and then you'll see the bloom time and the, and the, uh, the flower color. A couple of plants I hadn't originally planned for this garden, uh, Lobelia cardinalis. I had some extras that I bought for a conservation restoration project, uh, but it's a fantastic looking flower, which I'll show you later if you haven't ever seen it before. It does need wet soil. And uh, the area in this yard was full sun uh but kind of at the base of a hill so could tend to be wet at times um but can also dry out so it's a little bit iffy whether uh the lobelia would work and then uh verbena bonariensis which is an annual that self seeds very freely so you'll see what i did oh, yes it does <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so now I had a list, so now I had to make a plan. So I used uh, the influence of another, is this, is this uh, blocking the, the screen, this, pic, this, uh, this little window that I'm moving around right now? Can you see what I'm talking about, Ashley? We can see it. We can see it. Nope. Okay, it's not blocking, okay. It's not blocking. Okay, good. Uh, so this was another influencer, Pete Udolf. He's a Dutch designer who's done a lot with native plants. So he designed the Highline plantings and a number of large parks. Um, rather high maintenance areas, though, I have to say, they're, they're because they're large blocks of plants. Um, but his design forms are so interesting and beautiful. So I took that as a cue and I made myself a little, uh, a little key here with a little different little symbols. And then I made a plan. And I just taped together graph paper and made a scale. I think it was six inches to a square. And, and this is my plan. I couldn't even do this on my computer on my CAD program because it's so long that uh, I wanted to see the whole thing at one time easily. So I worked old fashioned way in paper. Hmm. And uh, the, this line running through the middle is a kind of meant to be like, sort of like a little river of 
was going to be a couple of different kinds of things, but I ended up using almost all little blue stem grass. Uh, and then I made uh, the the um, the size of this of the plants here based on their mature width, so I wouldn't overload this garden. And so I knew there was going to take a little while for them to grow. Uh, so I looked very carefully at the width, and there's a there's a certain amount of design uh, and repetition here. Um, a little bit of randomness, so it doesn't look overly designed like a perennial border. So it looks a little more natural, but you will see that, I think as you look at it, there's a little bit of rhythm um, and repetition to make it look a little more intentional than a, a meadow. All along the edge uh, is uh, this Nepeta early bird, which is a, which is a low growing cat mint. Um, and um, as, a, as an edge border, because I wanted the edge to stay low. Uh, so, and then I had to decide what size plants I was going to use. So I decided uh, for economy's sake and for the ability to, to sort of control the design that I would use these landscape plugs um, that are mail order. Now I used a lot from New Moon Nursery. This is only wholesale, but North Creek Nursery has wholesale and retail. Uh, so they will sell to the average homeowner. Um, they come 50 to a flat uh, by mail. And um, I'm going to show you uh, what they look like in a minute when they come. Um, another important thing is uh, preparation. So because, you know, I worked with a landscaper that I often work with um, to do this project, they scraped the whole front lawn uh, and put in new soil because they were putting in a new lawn. And I asked for in this area for a 50-50 compost sand because these kind of native plants, they really don't like a rich mix. They'll, um, they'll get too too floppy uh, if the, they need to struggle a little bit. So they need to send down roots and they, they need to, just like herbs, you know, they're, they're, which, which tastes better if they don't have a lot of uh, fertilizer, any fertilizer. The native plants too, they don't like fertiliz fertilization. So I made a pretty uh, lean mix, but we use compost from the composting facility um, and sand. And I had to mix it for me and we laid that down. Um, so then the plants arrive. This is my husband who's helping me. This is my backyard. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> I delivered like 40 boxes. <laughs> it's like Christmas. <laughs> one day. <laughs> so I got them fast as I could into the back. This was in uh, like late March. Um, you can see what they look like when they arrive. Uh, and um, uh, I didn't go over all the plants, but I'll talk about them a little bit. I had a, a ground cover that was a... a I was looking for the native strawberry, but uh, all I had available was something called Fregaria uh, lipstick, which is a cross between Fregaria, which is a wild strawberry, and a potentilla, uh, sink foil. So it's a very tough plant that can take uh, a lot of dryness um, and will run like a strawberry uh, with runners. Um, and uh, so there they are. It was lovely. It was really, really just, I was just in heaven. Um, let's see what I did next. I'm going to let him do a little preview here so I know where I'm going. Uh, right, so we did that. We had the prepared ground here. Um, I had to make a little erosion sock because there's a slight downhill grade and the organic matter was running off down into the driveway. So I made an erosion sock so we could keep that from happening. Um, and then we started laying out this, this, uh, this garden using my plan and, and this incredible preparation of taking all these plant pots numbering each quadrant. I was like playing the game Battleship with, with, with quadrants, uh, numbering and labeling each quadrant using uh, electrical conduit, two electrical conduit pipes with uh, <laughs> extended conduit pipes with one foot tape measurements and, and letters and uh, numbers and, and uh, laying out all these plants. It was, it was crazy, but it was fun. And then we didn't get all the plants at one time because uh, they, they weren't all available at the same time. So I had to put in popsicle sticks with codes so that I could then replace the popsicle sticks with the next plugs that came in. So it was a, quite an adventure. <laughs> and, uh, I said, what, what, are, what are you taking another picture of me for? Um, but I was really having a lot of fun. And at, at the end, uh, after we had filled in quite a few, it looked like this, not much. <laughs> my landscaper drove by, said, what do you think? Because it, you know, it was looking pretty good. It, and the lawn was looking nice. The, 
the foundation plantings were looking nice. He said, looks good, but there's a lot of weeds in there, Holly. I said, they're not, they're not weeds. Those are plants. <laughs> so um, anyway, time passed as it does. And um, things began to grow. And they, they grew very slowly. We did, uh, we did irrigate. So as, the, as this new lawn was being irrigated, we just had the heads turning and, and spraying onto this area. If you don't have irrigation for these, they would die. They, they, they need uh, irrigation that first year. Um, and then it began to grow more. And you're beginning to see the, the nepeta from these little tiny plants is now, this is the same year, it, it grew quite large. And interestingly, the outer edge, because of the irrigation and because the lawn is also irrigated, water is, is seeping into this, uh, this meadow area. So it's definitely wetter over here. And that catmint doesn't like the wet. Mm. Uh, so it's a little better up at this, uh, this uh, northern end. But as you move toward the driveway, um, I'm having a hard time getting some of the nepeta to, uh, to live. <clears throat> but um, this, this funny looking plant here is the spotted bee balm, Monarda punctata, um, which has uh, been very happy, you'll see later on. Um, and the verbena bonariensis that I brought in just from seedlings from my own yard uh, went berserk. It had basically no competition and it ended up very tall and it was really quite wonderful to watch and the butterflies were crazy about it. The homeowner wasn't so crazy about it. And the next year um, he, he pulled it out at the end of the year, but a little too late for it to not seed. <laughs> so I, I pulled out about 5 million seedlings uh, this year, um, but even so quite a lot of it um, uh, seeded. But in fact, um, I think you can see, okay, this is another set, a few other sets uh, from the other direction. Just seeing um, how it's growing in. There was one grass that, that was supposed to be a little blue stem that ended up being something else and I had to pull it out. So there was a mistake there. Uh, and down here, I'll show you this in a minute, is one cardinal flower that, that made it last year. Um, this is the Pycnanthemum incanum. This is a H-O-A-R-Y hoary mountain mint because it has, has a white, looks like a hoarfrost on the leaves. Um, that first year was blooming. There's more of the spotted bee balm. A little bit of uh, uh, goldenrod came in. Um, <clears throat> and there's that one cardinal flower. Lonely, but, but mm. promising. <laughs> uh, and there's the verbena. This is the first year sort of from across the street. This is the verbena bonariensis really taking pride of place and enjoying itself. <laughs> Looks pretty there. And yeah, I thought it looked rather pretty. So as a summary of year one, we had lots of this spotted bee balm, the verbena. Um, this early bird did very well in epithet and the mountain mints. And when I talk about mints, it, we're not using peppermint and spearmint, which will overrun a garden and take, just uh, take over everything. These are very particular mints. So don't go out and buy peppermint and spearmint for your garden. Um, mm. We had a little bit of the sweet golden rod, uh, some of the anise hyssop and the little blue stem did, did some work and look good. Um, hardly any echinacea, asters, and the atris because of, guess why? Rabbits. Our friends, our friends, the rabbits. They ate them right down to the ground. But I knew this might happen. And um, I did see that the root systems were intact and they were in fact spreading because I began to see little shoots coming up in different places. So I thought, okay, rabbits are doing a pruning job, strengthening the root system. Let's see what happens next year. So then one year passed. Now here you can start to see this design. You can see my little river of blue stem, little blue stem growing through. And you could see that early, this is not a very flattering photo for the flowers, but uh, the Waldsteinia, this is a barren strawberry, has a beautiful yellow flower early, and the Nepeta had a beautiful purple flower. And particularly on this drier end, it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I designed it so that the, the Waldsteinia would be kind of in the back part of this river and the, uh, that other strawberry the, with the pink flower, the Fragaria lipstick would be in, the, in the, these parts. Um, but strawberry, I just I discovered doesn't really like to stay where you put it, so <laughs> it's kind of moving around in different areas. 
Uh, about June this year, uh, mid-June, we're getting uh, a lot of nice growth. Uh, we're seeing a lot of cardinal flower coming up. Um, seeing this nodding onion, which is a plant I hadn't used before, but I'd heard so much about. Um, but no flowers yet. Uh, but I was a little nervous that there was no color, no flower color. Um, so I went out in a little bit, not a panic, <laughs> but I said, oh, we got to get some color in here because I want it to look good. So I bought some, uh, about, about 15 one gallon uh, perennials, some cultivars. So I, I wanted to control the color a little bit. So I got some pink yarrow. I got a pretty purple penstemon. I got some of the, and these are native plants, but cultivars, cultivated varieties. So if they came to seed, they probably wouldn't come this color. Um, if they if they seed, um, I got some but orange butterfly bush, uh, some Amsonia, some Monarda um, for a little early color, and that was good. It felt they, the the height was about right, and it it kind of filled in and gave a little more interest. And um, and then kind of magic started to happen. It's really. It's really quite amazing. I keep looking down because the, I'm looking at Ashley down the bottom of my screen, but I, I know if I look up here, I'm looking at everybody else. <laughs> so the nodding onion, is, behind here is the Pycnanthemum incanum. This is the uh, hoary mountain mint. And this is the nodding onion, which is starting to show, which much later than you think an allium would bloom for you gardeners. Uh, it started to show flowers late in July. Um, and um, and the, this is the, swamp milkweed, um, yeah. Asclepius inca uh, incarnata, and the- uh, Cardinal flowers back there. Cardinal flower, thank you. I keep I get stuck between uh, botanical names and common names. Um, and you see the little blue stem coming up. So we're starting to get some, some kind of pretty cool combinations and some real promise and some real flower. And, I got my first echinacea. So <laughs> the, this is the echinacea um, pallida, uh, pale coneflower, which has a very thin uh, pink leaf. It's very drought tolerant, um, unlike, unlike some of the other coneflowers, which really require some water to keep looking nice. These guys can tolerate drought, so, which is why I planted it here. So I got a couple of coneflowers, very excited that the rabbits didn't eat it all to the ground. You can see in the background, this strawberry starting to fill in. Back here, there are a, a gazillion seedlings of the mountain mint, which went crazy. Um, and, um, and here you see the nodding onion starting to open a little bit. It was a very pretty, the, this doesn't capture the color. It's a very pretty light pink color, look like a chandelier. And they're coming in all different places. Um, these are, this is the strawberry, the Fragaria lipstick, this, um, this strawberry, uh, sink foil cross, ground cover, some of the nepeta. <clears throat> and um, so that was like July, early August. And then, oh my goodness, <laughs> it started getting incredible. So it, it was, it's just as if someone turned on uh, mm -hmm. Technicolor. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. And I, I just couldn't get over it. And now the, this is what's happening right now. The cardinal flower, uh, I had added a couple more little cardinal flower plants, and now there's cardinal flower all in the middle. Um, the goldenrod, which is a sweet goldenrod, uh, Solidago odora, is blooming. The mountain mint, you see it kind of like weaves its way through, but stays low. Um, and the, the little blue stem is beginning to turn this beautiful tawny color that it turns uh, in the fall. Um, so now I'm like a proud parent. I have a million pictures to show. The asters came in uh, this year and the asters are blooming now with the mountain mint and the little blue stem and the goldenrod. Um, here's another picture of those combinations. So I'm, I'm like in love where <laughs> I go down and look at this all the time because every day it's different. Um, and, and every day it's got some kind of something growing that's a surprise. Um, and everybody who walks by, even when I'm, I come in there, I, we do a little weeding once in, while, once in a while. Today I had to do some weeding uh, because I, you know, I made the mistake of adding some topsoil uh, to just bag topsoil 
to give the, the strawberry um, something to root into because it was having a hard time rooting last year in, in what was there. I, I should say I added some, um, some leaf mulch right, right after the initial planting. But the strawberries were not, uh, not grabbing hold. They have to root, the little strawberry plantlets have to have something to root into. But I think, unfortunately, I brought in some crab, crabgrass seeds. So I've been taking out, uh, a, in just in one small area, some crabgrass. But other than that, there's been um, very little weeding. The, the spotted bee balm has seeded very freely. And I did weed uh, some along this edge because I wanted the edge to stay clean. Um, there is some spotted spurge, which is a native weed um, on the edge, but it's staying low and it doesn't really cause a problem. The strawberry goes out to the sidewalk and then stops basically because there's nothing for it to grow in. So it has a, there is an edge there um, that is maintained by the sidewalk and the mowing. Um, this is how it looks from across the street. You can see that mountain mint is very, uh, very happy, maybe a little too happy, we're not sure. We have to we have to decide if we're going to pull some of it. I actually took a lot of it and used it in another installation, um, so uh, where it can go freely. Um, and this is how it is from the across the street. Okay, so last thing. That's one beautiful baby there. Isn't it beautiful? I know. Yes. So I have to ask myself, you know, at this point, does it meet the design criteria? Um, does it look fairly presentable? Not too wild. It's certainly not, I, I, to, my, to my eyes, not too wild. I know it's probably not to everyone's taste, um, but it's certainly not too tall and it doesn't loom. So as you walk by it uh, on the sidewalk, you know, it doesn't feel scary. Um, it's bordered by something so it doesn't get out of control. So we have this natural border of the sidewalk, the driveway, and the lawn where it's mowed. It has flowers, certainly some parts of the growing season early. And then I added some things from mid season. And now it's just like a bouquet. Um, it has some visual interest during the winter if it isn't mowed down. So some of these things can, the owner decided not to mow it uh, last winter. Most things just fall, but the little blue stem stays up. So you see that river of this beautiful tawny grass uh, mm. all winter long. It was really quite wonderful to see. Um, and it certainly provides foods. I tried to get a, uh, I took films of some of the pollinators on these, some of these plants, because uh, they are, the, the spotted uh, mountain mint um, and the, and the, the pycnanthemum, the, the other mountain mints are magnets for uh, pollinators, um, honeybees, bumblebees, uh, these digger wasps. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing to watch. Uh, but I did learn some lessons. So landscape plugs work, and that was really great to learn. Um, the plants eaten by rabbits in the first year, they, they, uh, they did fine the second year, and part, partly because now this, everything surrounding those plants that the rabbits like is minty, and the rabbits don't like fragrant plants if they can avoid them, so they'll go find something else somewhere. So they're really not eating down uh, anything else now. Um, you do need to irrigate regularly. Um, and don't add topsoil. That was a mistake. Brought in that crabgrass. So the, you do have to do some regular weeding, especially when the plants are very sparse in the beginning. Um, it really depends on the soil that you put in. I saw one particular weed, and I don't know what it is, but that, that I had to pick out on a regular basis. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't onerous. Now, there are some volunteer plants here. Uh, so you have to expect that and then just evaluate whether you want them to come in or not. Um, some things we decided to take out and some things uh, I've let stay. Um, mm, yeah, the self-seeding. Yeah. There's a lot of self-seeding that's going on. I was a little worried it wasn't going to happen. And then I found out year two that absolutely it's, 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 mm -hmm. there's a lot of self-seeding and it's, it's really fine. Um, and trust that it's going to be appealing because uh, people love to watch this meadow as they walk by, they drive by, they talk to me as I'm walking there. And um, I had uh, the owner, David Mullen, he, uh, he put a little quote in here for me. Um, I'll read it to you. So this 100 foot by 10 foot wide meadow along the public walkway out in front of my property has been a joy to watch develop into this full blown meadow. It is an experiment in progress as the years go by. 
It attracts multiple species of bees, wasps, butterflies, and small birds like hummingbirds and yellow finches. The hummingbirds love the cardinal flower. They go yeah. nuts over it. It unquestionably helps the environment and has been a positive addition to the neighborhood with many people walking by and commenting on its beauty. I too enjoy its beauty and uniqueness. So he's very happy. Um, and a few other tips, uh, just uh, planning and soil prep are really critical. Definitely have to irrigate that first year and don't fertilize. Um, so when you're planting a garden like this, just, just as you would do in a perennial garden, just pay attention to that mature plant spread so that you, that you know how big things are gonna be. And you might wanna give time for the original plantings to develop before you add more plants. Um, because it does take, it, it takes at least a year, as I found out. Um, and some kind of edging. We did use a, a metal edging um, when I was starting to see the lawn creeping in. I said to David, we need some edging here. So we put in a, a metal edge, um, or you could do a deep cut um, along the edge, but the lawn will move into it. So there you have it, before um, and after. And, you know, it's an improvement for, for the neighborhood. It's really fun to look at and we're really enjoying it quite a bit. So I think it is. Front landscaping looks better too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Thanks, plants Molly. are doing well. We have uh, several questions and not much time, so I'm going to move oh, okay. right on to them. All righty. Um, Vicki Blake would like a recommendation for part shade. A recommendation for part shade? Yeah. Well, you, you, you need to look at your plants and see if they can be shade tolerant. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of plants that can tolerate some part shade. Um, some of these, like the Waldsteinia, the barren strawberry as a ground cover would be fine. Um, the others in this garden, most of these are full sun plants. Mm. Um, recommendation for meadow plants for part shade. I, I, I can't, I, off the top of my head, I'm not... Uh, I can think milkweed of a lot of shade. Milkweed does grow in <laughs> The Asclepias, yeah, the, the yeah. Uh, swamp milkweed. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but she also wants to know, how come the bunnies aren't eating the aster and cone flowers? Because the, the mints are very strong. Yeah. Uh, and they don't, they don't like to be uh, amongst them. They don't even go in there anymore. I haven't even seen the rabbits in there once. Yep, so, and I was so, thinking the allium might also scare them off too. Yeah, they might not like the taste of onion. So one thing I was, I was thinking as a suggestion might be to establish um, these distasteful plants first and then add in um, year two, you could mm -hmm. add in some of the plants that the rabbits don't like. Yeah, and there are a whole bunch. I had them in one of the newsletters, what rabbits don't like. Uh, an anonymous person would like to know, and this is a good question, how do you deal with the winter salt from the road or with snow plow, any impact? No, uh, he put, the homeowner put some stakes uh, along the edge, um, along the edge here, the driveway edge, tall stakes, so people would know. And we actually did, uh, we did some, I did some short stakes and some string in the very beginning, so people, so dogs wouldn't go, go in there. Um, but he did put some stakes. Um, he was, he was afraid. The salt didn't seem to be any issue at all. Road salt was no issue at all. Mm, that, I, I, yeah, but, the town's not using much salt now. Yeah, it does, wasn't a problem. Okay, we answered the rabbit question. What native shrubs do you use against the house? Oh, uh, I have um, in the back here is a variety of red twig dogwood so that it will be nice against the house. I have Ilex glabra. Uh, I have the shamrock Ilex glabra in the back here and back here. This is a hydrangea, a panicle hydrangea called Little Quick Fire, which doesn't get too tall. Um, and on this side, I have some Ilex reticulata. So this is a small uh, variety of um, winterberry holly. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, what are the pros and cons of annual mowing? What do you recommend for a large meadow where it's impractical to do extensive soil preparation? Well, in this case, when, you know, what I've learned about, about meadow development, if you've already got, if you're trying to establish a meadow on top of something that's existing already, it's difficult. Um, you really do need to start with clean soil. Um, but a, reg, a large meadow does need to be mowed uh, once a year because you're going to have, if, if I, I've been already pulling some shrub 
uh, and tree seedlings out of this this little meadow. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen. So you're, you're going to need to um, to mow it. Um, but for a large meadow, you know, if you if you have a large property and you have room for a large meadow that you would start from seed, you really need some professional care to do the maintenance. Uh, they may need to do some spot herbicide spray. They may need to do um, um, for weeds um, or flame. Uh, there are little, uh, not flamethrower, but a little uh, sort of torches that people walk around with and they burn them sometimes. So there's a lot of maintenance required in a larger meadow. Anyone who has a larger meadow can tell you that. And if anybody was wanting to start a meadow for next year, mm -hmm. could they put down the cardboard now and lay it down with rocks and kill the grass over the winter and then, does that work? Yeah, that should work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are the pros and cons of annual mowing? No, we did that one. You mentioned mowing down the garden. Is this recommended? And we, I think we handled that. Will a perimeter of mint plants also be a good idea to keep rabbits out of a vegetable garden? A well, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't keep the rabbit. I, I hope that that perimeter of that cat mint would keep the rabbits out and uh, it didn't. So um, I think for a vegetable garden, you need a fence. Yes. <laughs> I yes. mean, the, 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 the mint perimeter uh, probably would discourage them. Um, I think it, if they can't see in, that discourages them also. So if you had something tall on the outside, that might be helpful. Matter of fact, at a morning study meeting yesterday, several people mentioned they were not only having problems with rabbits, but chipmunks and woodchucks. So with the vegetable garden, it's better to have a wood base that goes a little under the soil and then a fence on top of it to keep them as much out of there as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it gets really hard otherwise. I and know. it's very sad to see the chipmunks get into your garden and take a bite out of each tomato and then toss it. To I know. The <laughs> oh, it really is unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. How small a meadow can I make using these plants? Ah, so I was thinking about this. You could probably do something about, uh, you know, eight by 10, uh, maybe eight by eight or, or something, eight by three, something like that. Because so, there's, some of them are, you know, good size, like these mountain mints. Some of the mountain mints are larger, some of them are smaller. Um, but I think to establish uh, a nice community of plants, it probably should be something about I don't think you could do, I mean, you can put, you know, and you can put any of them anywhere, um, yeah. but to make this kind of community, um, maybe eight by four would be big enough, small enough. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't be discouraged if you don't have that much space, you can do something smaller too. You could try something smaller. And it depends how it's looking from the street and from your house. You got to figure out, it's a beautiful thing to look at what she's done there. So you want to see it from all views. Mm -hmm. Could you use larger size plants? If I have some larger ones around, then I could plug them in? Why not? Yeah. Why not? I mean, we were, we were doing a large area here. So, you know, to make it economically feasible uh, to cover the area, um, we, we wanted to use these smaller plants. Uh, but, you know, if you're using, if you're making a smaller garden or you're making a larger garden and you can afford to use larger plants, you know, you. You could, but there's something, I think there's something to be said for it developing together um, from small plants. Um, I don't know, that's just a supposition, but I think- Like it, a family growing up? Exactly, <laughs> all the kids growing together. Well, well, that might be one of the benefits of using landscape plugs. You and I looked at a meadow and she said that they had tried seed two years and it didn't work very well. And what mm -hmm. worked for her with the landscape plugs, and that's a large meadow that we were looking at. Right. Um, well, Holly, I thank you. I knew you'd do a beautiful job. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, nice. Thank you. Holly is quite a landscaper to work with, um, and it's really been fun. Next week, and it's perfect because Holly led right into it, Linda Walsh will be talking about planning before you plant, mm -hmm. or how you choose where you put your plants. Instead of doing it like me, like, oh, I have a plant, I'm gonna put it here. You make a nice big plan and that would be a lot better. Right, and that's a lot of fun to do. Yeah, it is a lot of fun, but. Yeah, it doesn't have to be something very, you know, computer oriented. You can see I did it on graph paper with colored pencil. So it's a really enjoyable. 
just take a look at how big those plants will get at maturity so you have a good sense. That's what most gardeners don't look at. So look well, at the tag. <laughs> I would think doing what you did was a perfect winter project or pandemic project before you oh, get perfect. it around. That's for sure. And, pl and, and, and plugs are better, sorry, plugs are better in the spring than they are in the fall. Uh, so yeah. just so you're aware of that, but planting them in the spring is, is uh, more successful because they have more time to establish. Okay. Well, I think having a meadow is a lovely idea. And all these lawns do nothing for the wildflowers or the pollinators, and we could really do something special. Mm -hmm. I thank you for all watch. Oh, well, there's one more question here. Oh. I think it was just a, a compliment from oh, uh, a Georgia compliment. Harris. Thanks, Georgia. Excellent job, Holly. Thank you, uh, Georgia. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Uh, we will see you next week, hopefully. And yes, this is on YouTube at the library. You can get it through the library or just go to Google and look it up that way. Yep, I'll be sending that out later. Okay. And, that, and how about that plant list, Matt? Is that plant that list too. available? That will be on the recap. So everyone who attended will be able to see that. And if they want to rewatch it again, they will be able to. Oh, great. Okay. Would you send me the plant list too, Matt? Sure, I'll include you. <laughs> I can send it to you. <laughs> well, I don't always get those things. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everybody. Right. Be healthy. Thank you. Take care. We stay on for a minute, Holly. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye. You did.